Right. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Today's Monday. Uh, so before we get started back into awesome slides and content, we have some uh, class things to discuss. Um, okay, so there's been some questions about what exactly the grading breakdown of each of the projects, homeworks, midterms is going to be. Um, so what we're going to do, the weights are definitely going to remain the same. Uh, basically, the idea was project one and two were supposed to be very simple, and so you should get full credit on those. Uh, turns out for some people it was more difficult because the submission system, whatever. Uh, so the basic idea is what we'll do is uh, we'll take whichever is the higher of either projects one through five each have equal weight, meaning they both are 7% each, or basically one and two are the same weight. Right, they're considered kind of as, you can consider them as half, they're half, they together make one project. Um, and then that means each project's three, four, and five bump up, and they're 8.75%. So we'll do this, uh, whichever one is higher, that will be your project grade. Right? Um, so you don't have to worry about that, but if you're worried about you're on the cusp of the class or you wanna calculate out what your grade could potentially be or what your maximum could be, this is what you should keep in mind. Questions on that? Yeah. Um, so for the last project, I had like, uh, I didn't get three uh, implemented correctly, mm -hmm. but I did get like, uh, I think eight out of 15. Okay. But sometimes, like I think test case four, it would mess up with the uh, syn syntax. So like it would do Sometimes. <laughs> like it didn't show up on the test cases for the grading, but did show up on my own. Then I would probably not complain about something like that. <laughs> so would I get would I get the fifty percent reduction, or do you, do you like add to whatever the grading, the whatever is on the submission system, right? Yeah. So yeah. If that's fine. fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, any other general questions like that about? So then obviously your score would be proportional based on. Um, so we pretty much have we actually have the project for grades. Most of them will post them later. Uh, we're kind of waiting today if there's any uh, late submissions. Uh, but yeah, the average was like a 68 of those that submitted, so it's actually pretty good. Uh, any other questions about this grading policy for project program projects? Yeah. That's true. Not necessarily a question. Hey, 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 hey. Right. Not necessarily a question, just want to say thank you for the extra two days. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Uh, it wasn't really me. I mean, it was your fellow students. Um, all right, Any, anything else that's a weird comment? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, anything else? It's pretty clear, right? So you should be able to go home, calculate exactly what these two numbers are, choose the greater one. Uh, if you do the math wrong, it's not my fault, right? <laughs> Okay. All right, any questions on this? All right. So this takes care of um, the first issue. Uh, let's talk about, um, I guess we could do homeworks next. Okay, so homeworks, I said at the beginning that there'd be six homework assignments, um, but when I was looking at the schedule, it, we really only had time for five homework assignments. And I know it's a huge bummer to all of you to miss out on that six homework assignment. <laughs> Um, so what I was planning on doing is uh, you can do, I will issue a sixth uh, homework assignment. If you submit that, uh, the most you can get out of it is 70 out of 100, but it will replace like your lowest homework score. So if you uh, submitted a homework late or missed a homework, you can kind of use this as a little replacement. You have to actually do the homework, right? The most you get is so if you get, you get seventy percent of whatever you submit. Okay. And obviously, if, it does, if it's not greater than anything, it won't affect your grade, right? Yeah. Questions on that? Comments? More comments? No, no more comments. Today. Yeah. Uh, any questions about the homework? Do you want more projects? The projects a lot. I've already worked on. Uh, any questions on homework? <laughs> homework. Okay. Uh, all right. So done with homework. Okay. So 
Now about projects. Uh, so the TA has been um, getting inside my head, uh, and he thinks it was a good idea, and I think it's a good idea. Uh, what we'll do is you can submit either project three or project four late, either one, only one, and you can get at most 70% of whatever you get. So you basically have from now until project five is due to resubmit one of those. Uh, whichever one you submit latest is the grade you will take. And yeah, so I know a lot of you are really close on getting one of those to work, so uh, get it working. Obviously, we'll check for academic integrity violations, so please don't take the easy way out. Um, yeah, so if you do the work, you will get points on one of those projects. So questions, this should be pretty much everything you need to know of should I drop this class from now until the fourth, right? Any questions? Nothing? Yeah. So like say you resubmit project three and it gets not much higher than our first score, and then with the 70% score. It won't, it won't, it won't, not, it's like you're not going to get lower. No, no, yeah, it's whatever is higher, exactly. Yes. I mean, it could negatively impact you if you submitted somebody else's code, and then we found it, and then now you've uh, done bad things, so we have to deal with that. But I don't want to deal with it, so don't do it, yeah. Basically, if you've gotten, out, if you've gotten 70% on either, on both of them already, it wouldn't stop it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Do we know when the next homework and the project will be? Uh, I will assign next homework and next project on Wednesday. I want to give you guys at least a little bit yeah, yeah. of a breather. Um, so this way you can spend this time to finish project three or project four, whichever is your lowest, and just get it done. Then you can have all semester to focus on project five. Yeah? If I wasn't able to turn in project three and I turn it in now, do I get points or no? Uh, you'll get whatever to this thing. So this is. So yes, you'll get at most 70% on whatever that submission is. But you can't do that for both Project 3 and Project 4. Okay. It's an exclusive or. Yeah. Uh, on the 4th, this upcoming Wednesday. We don't have class next Wednesday. It's uh, Veterans Day. Yeah. Is there a special submission process for resubmitting Project nope. 3? Nope, just submit on the, uh, submit on through the submission site and we'll Get it. We'll take your latest one. So if you want to try and do both to see whatever is maximum, uh, by the, the date that Project 5 is due, which I think the last week of class that Wednesday, uh, just submit it. Okay. Submit the one that you want ready. Last. Uh, yeah. Uh, anytime from now up until Project 5 due date. So Project 5 is due uh, the last Wednesday, the second. So the second at midnight will be the due date there. So do it, do it early, get it done, that way you know where you stand in the class, and everything's all good. More questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, we'll go here and then there. Yeah. What's Lambda Calculus? Do you really want to get there? Lambda Calculus is awesome. It's going to blow your mind. I'm super stoked to start it. We'll probably start it next week. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? So project or yes. I don't know. I hadn't considered it. What do you guys think? Is that fair? Should, it? Should you get extra credit for submitting it late? No. I, mean, I don't know that you're a completely unbiased audience right now. I got so can you get more than above the 70% reduction, if you got 105%, would we take 70% off that? Uh, I'd say yes, that's, I guess that's fine. What's 70% of five? I don't know, something, it's a number. All right, anything else, any other questions? Okay, so any, any other general class stuff about grading or grades in general? Yeah. So, say for one of the projects, if you had just started in late but got below 70%, would 
Just resubmit, and then you'll, yeah. All right, good. Well, now we've got to get on to the material, because we clearly have to get the Lambda Fabulous very soon. De de scarify it for everyone. All right, Act two, uh, pass by name. So here we're talking about pass by name semantics for, uh, for function parameters, yeah. Wait, but what? It's a type checking problem, right? Yes. Because more, more of a Python type checking, not like a Java type checking, right? Uh, what's the difference? So in Python, we generally don't declare any variables before. And generally, we just use it, and it will be the It can be used in the declaration part, not in So what are, what are types checked in Python? Anybody with Python experience? So what does that mean at runtime? It means like whenever a type is on the, the right hand side, it gets applied to the left hand side. So. Uh, so almost, kind of. So in Python or JavaScript or a lot of scripting languages like Ruby, types are checked at runtime dynamically. So the, the interpreter has metadata that says, hey, this variable is declared as an int, and this variable is declared as a function. So if you try to assign them, before it does the assignment, it checks the types. Then, when it's executing, and if there's any error, it exits. So did anyone here execute the programs that they were trying to type check? No. No, I hope not, right? I mean, it, that doesn't even make sense. We, we didn't really talk about how even the semantics there were. Uh, so in that case, what you're doing, you're static type checking, right? So you're type checking it without executing the code beforehand, after parsing. So in that case, you, you did just what Java or C or C++ does. It's a static type checking. Uh, the difference is we also, we had implicit variables in our language, which meant that we didn't have to declare something before it was used. But that doesn't mean you have to type check it at runtime, which is what you saw in what you implemented. <coughs> which is why languages like uh, OCaml and ML and Haskell are kind of fun and cool. Because you don't have to declare types, but it does Hindley Milner type inference to infer the types throughout the program and checks that statically. So you get the fact that you don't have to declare types, but it will do the type checking statically, so it will find type errors for you, which is nice. All right, any other questions? That was an interesting one. We started off with, so in project four we did a type checker, yes. <laughs> yes, I hope you did, I hope you did. Okay. All right, so what are the three, we talked about three different uh, variable passing semantics to functions. What are those three? Name. Pass, what is it? Name. What's the full name of what you're talking about? What is the name of the semantics? Somebody want to help me out? Where is it? Pass by name. What was the other one? That's one. Pass by reference. And the third? Pass by value. Yeah, going back two classes. All right, and I said pass by name, so that's not, you know, that's, right. it's the most confusing one. That's true. Okay, so we've been looking at pass by name semantics. So what are the semantics of pass by name? Yeah. So the formal parameters are replaced by the actual parameters? What do you mean by replaced? Text-wise. Yeah, text-wise. So it does, it's as if you textually replaced all instances of the parameters in the function with whatever you pass into the function. So let's look at an example. So this is C code. Um, so here we have our function P that takes in an integer Y. It sets a local variable J to be Y. It increments I. And which I is this referring to? Global, the global I. Um, are we using static scoping or dynamic scoping here? Static. static. How do you know? You said the rest of the class is static. Yeah, because I said it. <laughs> right? It's just like in the type rules, right? It's it's that way because we said that that's how the type system works, and just like this. So like, uh, so we said from here on out, pretty much all the examples, at least in class, will be static scoping. And if there's any question, it'll be said and specified on a midterm, perhaps. Okay. So we take j is equal to y, we increment the global i, and then we return j plus y. Seems pretty straightforward. 
Uh, next we have a function q, which has its own local variable j, which then sets the, which i is this? Global i, and then prints out function p called with what as the actual parameter of p? i plus j, can I do that? Why? Type? Same type. Same, what, same types, what are the types? Integers. Integers, okay, that's one reason why, yes. That's another reason. Yeah. So you have access to both i and j. I have access to both i and j in the scope of q. Yeah, that's one reason. What's the third? Pass by name. What was that? Pass by name. Because of pass by name. Uh, no, so uh, because the semantics of Function, uh, function invocation says that we can call a function with expressions for each of, the, each of the arguments. So here we're saying, hey, the first parameter to this function p that we're trying to invoke, the actual parameter is the expression i plus j. Okay, and now we have our function main where we just call q and then return zero. Um, so if I was running this as a C, so is this a valid C program? No, why not? I know it was you. Why not? Because you're going to use pass by name. Because I'm going to use pass by name. <laughs> but I didn't ask that. I asked if it's a valid C program. Yes. Yeah? So what's, gonna, what's it going to output if, when we execute this as a C program? So what kind of semantics does C have for function invocation? Pass by value. What is it? Pass by value. How does that pass by reference? But it's not. It's passed. You're asking C. Yeah. C. C. The C oh, right. C only has passed by. Right. So C does not. So C is only passed by value. Uh, C++, you have the option of sent doing pass by value or pass by reference. Um, so if this was pass by value, what would the output here? There's one print statement, right? So, so it output 6. So what gets passed into P with pass by value? 2. two? Uh, and then it returns what? 2 plus, which is, let's do it like elementary school teachers feel like. Awesome. 4. And then what gets printed out? 4. 4 gets printed out, right? So does the value of y, ch does uh, the parameter that we pass into p change? So what about pass by reference? What would the, the difference here be? There'd be no difference. Why? Because we don't ever use j outside of the print function. We don't ever use j? Which j? So like the j in void q, mm -hmm. that value would change to be 4, and that's the difference. But we don't ever access that later, so there's no difference. So, but if we were to access that j later, then it would look different. Does this, what changes this j? If you were to pass it by reference into p, then it would have changed. Am I passing J in, t in as P as oh, the actual parameter? Right, just kidding. Yeah. What are the semantics of passing an R value by reference? Huh, that's a good question. Uh, what are the semantics of passing an R value in by reference? So what do you mean by R value? Right, so why is this an R value? Because why? Right, so we're taking two L values, we're adding them together to get a value. Does that have a location associated with it? No. No, we can't draw a box for I plus J, right? We're not assigning it anywhere to anything that has a location. Uh, so I guess that was a really tricky trick question. Uh, so you can't actually, this wouldn't, this would uh, not be allowed with reference semantics, or so it would pass by reference semantics. So the compiler would say, hey, I need an L value here, and you're passing in an R value, so I'm not going to compile that. Okay, so with uh, pass by name semantics, so anyone want to guess what the output's going to be in pass by name semantics? And include accompanying guesses? Fault. Fault. Error. 10. 32. 25. All right, one thing that may help us to think about is let's 
Remember, we're thinking textual replacement here. So let's think about what is this function p that's going to be executed where we replace all instances of what with what in the function? Replace y with i plus j. Replace what? y with i plus j. Replace y in function p with i plus j. Right? So that's the semantics here of pass my name, is we want going to replace all the y's with i plus j. So you can think of it as, as we have this function call, and we say int j is equal to i plus j, i plus plus, return j plus i plus j. So, but what do these j's and i's refer to? An R value. Uh, no. Which, so I should say, which i does this refer to here? Global i. Definitely, right? So re remember, we talked a little bit about on Wednesday that when you do pass by name reference, it's the scope of wherever the function is invoked that the parameters are used. So wherever those are bound to, so here i is bound to the global i. Uh, what's j bound to here? The local j, which has the value 2, right? So it's not going to affect the j in the function. Uh, so we just need to keep it straight in our heads that this i plus j returns to, refers to global i and global j. So if I compiled this with a special version of GCC that allowed pass by the name, and I ran it, what would the output be? Don't know. Truth finds it. I was waiting for somebody to raise their hand. Nobody wants to raise their hand. Yeah. Well, wouldn't I just have a value that was already in the memory address and we didn't assign it in? Oh, wait, never mind. We assigned it zero. Right. We assigned I zero right here. So that's good. So now that you know that I has the value zero, what's going to happen? So on this line, what's the J that's local to the function P? What is that J going to be? Two. Two? So it's going to be i, which is 0, j. And then i plus plus is going to be what? Increment i to be 1. Now we're going to return j. So which j is this? 2, the one that's local. Or yes, the one that is local. It's going to be 2 plus i plus j. What's i plus j now? 3. So what's this function going to return? 5. So why do we return 5 and not 4? Let's go break it down. Yeah. Because i is reference to the global i. Right. So, and what happened to i during the function call? It got incremented by 1. Right. So the problem is this function that we called is using this global bit of data that we're using in our expression to pass by name. So that messed up, uh, that changed what our expression i plus j was, right? And depending on if i was incremented more here, or the orderings of these, if i was, uh, the i plus plus was the first thing that happened, that would change what value we got back from this function. Does this seem like an easy way to code? No. Yeah? What would happen if in q we made i equal to 1? Uh, if in q we set i equal to 1 where? Here? Uh, so if i was 1, how would that change things? So it would be 1 plus 2 would be 3, and then it would increment i again, so i would be 2, and then it would be 3 plus uh, 2 plus 2, which would be 7. Yes. Ooh, too much math, guys. That's why I need calculators. Oh. So yeah, pretty crazy way to code, right? Um, so this is why we're not programming languages that have this path by name. Um, so let's look at, what do I want to do now? Ah, ah yes, let's look at another aspect of path by name. Okay, so here we just have a function foo that takes in a parameter called test and just returns 10. And then we have a function main that sets, says int a is equal to zero. It says integer b is equal to foo a plus plus, and it prints out the values of a and b. So in pass by name, or pass by value, what's the output here? What's, what's a going to be here when we, when we get to this printf? One. One. And what's b going to be? 
10. What about pass by reference? Oh no. Why oh no? Yeah. It would be zero ten. Uh, be zero ten. Yes. Yeah, I think it would be. Yeah. That's a tricky question of what is a plus plus return. I think it's going to use the value of a, so it would use a as a reference. Um, pass that in, but it doesn't really matter if you get 10 back. And then it should increment A. So what does it print? Uh, 0, 10. Should be 0, 10. Why would it be, don't you post increment A after the is done? Oh, sorry, 1, 10. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, zero. So A is definitely going to get incremented in this, in pass by reference. Oh, I was going to pass by reference. Pass by reference or pass by name? Uh, in oh in pass by in pass by reference so yeah so now the question is pass by name what's pass by name going to do Same zero ten zero ten so why zero ten because it's not actually getting a value from a plus plus it's just looking to replace it so it never uses it right so um, remember we're doing textual replacement now so if we look at the function foo and replace everywhere that parameter test is used in the function with a plus plus, where is a plus plus, where is the parameter test used? Never. It's never used. So we're never going to evaluate that expression. And so a plus plus is never going to get executed. So yes. Clarify. Yes. Going back to pass by reference. Yes. That actually works. Yes. I believe this would this would compile it pass by reference because it would use A, get the reference to A, pass it to the function, nothing, A wouldn't change, and then it would increment A. Yeah. So pass by name, like you literally copy and paste it the parameter. Exactly, exactly. And so because of that, right, because we're never using that parameter test, it never gets evaluated. So it could, it, in this case, it would never, A would never get incremented. Uh, yeah, let's go here. Inside foo, if you had like A used, would it mm -hmm. increment the A inside the main? Uh, so, I'm is that, not. right, is that a question about path? So, you got to think, is this a scoping problem or a variable semantics problem? Well, I guess it's a scoping. Yeah, so it's scoping, right? So that's, so, um, so this is just what happens at function invocation time. So before we even get there, before we run the code, right, the compiler has already linked up all the variables to their locations. So if we tried to use A in foo, it would say, hey, A is not defined with static scoping. But if you did it with dynamic scoping, that would make for a very interesting problem. <laughs> yeah, you guys are really good about that. Idea generation through questions. Uh, more questions? There was other hands that were up. No? No? Cool. OK, then if I run this, so I'll get the value 0 and 10. Um, so it's actually a really cool kind of byproduct here. So this is essentially, uh, some languages have what's known as uh, lazy evaluations. In this case, uh, function parameters aren't actually evaluated until they're used. So in this case, you can pass stuff to a function that may or may not get evaluated, uh, which could be can be cool. You can have infinite data structures in Haskell. You can make an infinite list. and the list is only generated as much as you need, so it's kind of fun. But it really messes with your mind. Okay, all right, so is this just in some esoteric domain that you have to learn because I tell you to? I mean, yes, that's the answer pretty much yes for everything. But uh, the other thing is, how could you, let's say you wanted to make a language, could you implement this behavior in C? Rephrase the question. Could you implement, so we saw that pass by reference semantics, you can implement using pass by value semantics by using pointers. Right, so you're still copying the pointer, but the pointer is to an address so you can change what something, the value that something is outside your scope with pass by 
a value. So can you do the same thing with pass by name? Maybe if you made it like, like the pass by function and then all those functions and this would find if you macro all your functions. What was that? If it was just a macro, if every function was a macro. If every function was a macro, how would that help? Oh, so then you could replace the yeah, so that would be um, so macros, right, are just textual substitutions of function calls. Uh, then you get into some issues, though, you, I think, would run into the problem of if you try to define a function like this, called like A++ here, um, where does this plus plus actually go in the actual evaluation of the function? And is there any scoping conflict between the parameters that are defined and the local parameters? Uh, so that might be tricky with uh, local scope. You, you could maybe get away with it. So what, what was it that you said? Maybe uh, create, you would have to create everything as a function and then pass that function in, and that would replace every single piece. Uh, what do you mean piece? So like if we were to pass in an expression that was like A, a plus B, mm -hmm. we, instead of passing in that, we would pass in a, a function that was called A plus B and for that, that, that. Yeah, so actually, what if we wrap, so if we think about it, right? In pass by name, every time we want to get a value from one of the parameters, we have to execute something in that context that called us, right? Whatever was passed to us. So if we basically turn those into little functions, and every time we want a value, we call that function, then it can generate a value for us. And every time we use it, we call that function again, so any side effects get properly replicated. Uh, so we can go back to our other example and do this completely with functions in C. Now it gets a little tricky. Uh, we have to kind of change some variables around, but the basic idea is here. Uh, so here we have the global i again. Uh, we have a function p, which takes in an integer y. Uh, OK, so this is all the code that we already saw. Uh, so we have q, uh, blah, 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 blah. We have main, we're calling q, returning 0. So this is on the left-hand side. This, yeah, your left. Uh, that side is all the code that we already saw at my name. So if we replace all of these parameters with instead functions, then we can actually get the same behavior. Uh, so we'd have to uh, create our function q, and q is um, pretty much the same. So sorry, this is a little jumbled, but all right, where are we at? OK, let's look at it. So we need to kind of create this function i plus j to capture the semantics here of this i plus j. And so what's this function going to return? It's going to return an int, which you can tell from the type signature. It's kind of in the name, right? Yeah, it's going to return i plus j, right? So this, the i corresponds to the global i, and the j, essentially we've lifted this j, instead of being local to the function q, we're lifting it out to be global scope. Couldn't you instead just use pass, or put make a pointer in and pass the pointer in? Uh, yes, you could, but we're simplifying things a little bit. Uh, that would, yeah, that would complicate things. Okay, so this function i plus j, when you call it, what does it return? i plus j, can you call it multiple times? Yep. And every time you call it, what's it going to evaluate for the values of i and j? Yeah, the global, whatever is in the global i and j. So if anybody messes with that global i, the next time you call this function i plus j, that's going to be reflected. So we can write our function p, where instead of now taking in an, an integer y, now we're going to take in a function that takes in zero parameters and returns an integer. And we're going to use this every place we use a y, we're instead going to call this function y. So we'll set our local j to be the result of calling function y. We're going to increment i. And then we're going to return y j plus the function call of y. So is this valid? C code? Yes. So then what did I pass when I called P? What am I passing in here? What was it? I think somebody just said it. Yeah. Yeah, function pointer, right? What's the type of this function pointer? To an int function, or pointer to a function that returns an int and takes no parameters. 
Uh, yes. So think about it at like a function level, right? So what is so what is it? You said it's. What are we talking about types of functions? There's a whole homework assignment on it. Yeah, like the return type, the number of parameters. Great. Right. How many parameters? Uh, zero. Zero parameters, and what does it return? Uh, int. An int. There we go, right? So we're passing in a function that takes in zero parameters and returns an int. Right? Just like when you did Hindley Milner type inference, you calculated uh, what the type of a function is. And this is here. Here we have a function p that takes in a function as a parameter. And every time it wants a value, it calls that. And it evaluates the current value of i plus j. So is this valid C code? Yes. Yes, no? Maybe? Yeah. That's ah, valid code. And what happens when we run it? What's going to be output? different than pass by main semantics? Uh, is the output any different? No, but that doesn't mean it's not different. Uh, so let's rephrase it another way. How is it different from, how is the program on the left different from the program on the right? It's longer. <laughs> that is correct. A valid statement. Does that mean it's more complicated? Hmm? Yeah. Correct. So, yeah, so here I'm using only pass by value to emulate pass by main semantics. So this is to show you that it's not impossible, right? This is just, uh, these are kind of just different ways to express things. But it's up to you as a language designer to specify what these semantics are so they have very well-defined semantics. And it's up to you as the programmer to underst understand them and to know what they mean and what the different types are and what that means semantic-wise. Uh, but you know, under the hood, you can implement, you can emulate either of them. So it's kind of cool. Questions? Pass by name? Yeah. So for the primary to P, it's a pointer to a function. Yes. That takes no okay. Correct. That takes in no parameters, which is where the void comes from, and returns an int. So this is only, the only thing is here, that's, so we didn't really get into it, but this is uh, C syntax for specifying, um, specifying a, a function pointer. But we've seen how to define pointer types, or we've seen how to define function types, right? That's, there's no difference except for the, uh, the syntax of how we express that versus our way with Hindley Milner and with this way here. Okay, so now that you're all 100, well, let's say 80% masters of function parameter passing semantics, what are the semantics of Java? So you want to say that? Louder? Pass by value for primitives and pass by reference for objects. Pass by value for primitives. So primitives being in stars, whatever the, the standard buildings are. And pass by reference for objects. Uh, so is that, is that true? I think so. You think so? So what would that mean in Java? When you pass in a object, is it just take the pointer to the object? We're not talking about how it's implemented. Are there any pointers in Java? Not really. No, so it doesn't make sense to talk about pointers. 
right? All we have are objects, we have variables, we're calling functions. Let's look at an example, so maybe we can debate this, look into this some more. Okay, so here I have a function, so now we switch to Java code, right? Uh, so here I have a class called testing, which has a field called foo. And then I am defining a class called parameter passing, which I have to do all this nonsense just to like print out some things. Uh, so okay, so we finally get to our main function. So I'm gonna create a new object called testing. I'm gonna create a new object called snap. I'm gonna set uh, an object called bar, an object called snap. I'm gonna set bar's foo to be zero. I'm gonna set snap's foo to be 10. I'm gonna call a function called pass by question mark. That's gonna pass in bar and snap. And it's gonna print out both of their foo fields. So what is it gonna print out? <coughs> Why do you need to know the function? By knowing the function, you can know how the foods actually changed. So by knowing the function, we can know how they're actually changed. So if it was passed by value, would we need to know no. what the function is? No. If it was passed by reference, would we need to? Yes. OK, let's look at this function passed by question mark. OK, here are the formal parameters are. We have a parameter A of class testing and a parameter B of class testing. So the first thing I'm going to do in this function, I'm going to say b is equal to new testing, create a new uh, object of class testing. Uh, then I'm going to set b's foo to be 100, and I'm going to set a's foo to be 42. So now you can see both functions. So what's the output here going to be? I guess first question, is this valid Java code? I sure hope so, because I it compiled and ran. So. So what's the output here? So is it passed by value or passed by reference? That's it. So bar.foo is going to output? Output what? 42. And snap.foo is going to output? 10? 100? Is it passed by value or passed by reference? So are these objects? So you, you. Is it passed by value or passed by reference? The passed by question mark. Testing is an object, so passing by reference. Right, so then what's the, what is snap.foo going to be after this function is called? It'll be 10? But I'm passing, I'm creating a new, I'm setting B is equal to new testing here. So it's passed by reference. That's before the, before the, sorry, I missed this video. Um, it would be 100. It would be 100? 10. So what's this program going to output? Is it passed by value or passed by reference? Passed by reference. Yeah. It's passed by reference, but the B reference is lost when you finish oh, wait, that, no. that question mark. So it'll be yeah. the previous 10. What do you mean the B value is going to be? Isn't the, so, isn't the, the B value in there? Uh, mm -hmm. it's the, it creates a new testing and places it there, but that particular reference is lost so that it goes in the end. It goes out of scope, so it's going to be a, a deallocation error? So based on our definitions, is it passed by value or passed by reference? Passed by it's, sort of, it's like passed by dereferenced value. Passed by dereferenced value. 
we should write a blog post about that. <laughs> Give that a name. That's not, that's not a bad name. Okay, so have we come to a decision on what the output of this program is at least going to be? 4210. 4210? Yeah. Does everybody agree? Anybody disagree? Just question everything you thought you knew about Java? It's been so long since you programmed in Java. Thinking in pointers in C now. Is that good? Hmm? Is what? Is it good? So think in pointers? Yeah. yeah. I think it's good. You gotta, do, you gotta have both. You gotta have both. Okay, so oh, do I run this anywhere? <laughs> I think so. Uh, okay, so it does run. It definitely does. I've ran this. Um, so we, it all goes back to what do we say about the semantics of Java's assignment operator? So I believe we called it uh, sharing semantics, where the names, the names on an equal statement, the names get rebound to a new location. Right? So when you say A is equal to a new foo, you bind the name A to some new object foo. And then when you say B is equal to A, you're saying that B is now bound to that box foo, that same, that same new object. Right? So it, Java is this weird case where you have kind of both. So you are going to get, so bar.foo is going to output a uh, hundred, uh, so it's going to be, sorry, you're right. Uh, it's going to be, what do we say, 4210. Or 42, yeah, 4210 is what it's going to output, right? So Java has this weird, it's, it is, so you can think of it as, let's see, it's not right. Uh, hmm. uh, I don't know that I believe this statement. Um, okay, so the problem is that we have an object, and we're not, copying the whole object into there, right, as we've seen. So we can call methods on that object, we can change fields on that object, and those changes will propagate. Um, all right, so then let's talk about how this is implemented under the hood, and hopefully this will help us think about it. So what are we talking about with uh, pass by dereference? Yeah, pass by dereference value. Mm -hmm. And because if you pass a pointer into something, it uh, essentially makes a copy of that pointer mm -hmm. inside the function. And so um, if, if you re-put another value onto that pointer, it's lost at the end of it. You don't see where that is. And the only reason that works in Java is garbage. So what language is uh, the JVM written in that runs Java programs? C. C, right? Or maybe C++. I don't know for certain. But yeah, you have it. So I guess think about it. I don't have as much pointer experience as, as he does, but the way I think about it is just two levels. Mm -hmm. So when it's all when it's on the first level, then it's a pass by value. But when you get to that second level inside the object, it's passed by reference. So in this case when you copy the object in there, you that was a top level action that kind of overrode everything else. And that's why I think it back. Right. So it's definitely passed by value, right? Because we can't change what we pass in, what that points to, right? So it's definitely, at least by our semantics, right? The way we're defining it. So it's definitely not passed by reference because we're not changing. There's no way we can change what bar and snap are bound to, right? From inside this function call. Um, so definitely not passed by reference and definitely not passed by name, right? Because that would be crazy. Um, so it's gotta be, from our definitions, passed by value. And so if we don't wanna change our, our definitions, uh, then we can say, well, it's passing by value, uh, and the assignment semantics are such that a dot b dot foo is now bound to a new location which has the value 100. Is that right? Uh, so the way I think about it is actually by thinking about it under the hood, right? It's all pointers, so it's passed by value with pointers everywhere, and they just don't ever let you have access to any of the pointers. So that's how I like to think about it. So you can never change something that calls you because you can't get to that raw pointer to change it because it's passed by value. 
Uh, but you can change fields just like you can change, change structs, fields of a struct, when you pass a pointer to a struct into a function. Yeah? So the output was 4210, correct? Yes. Yeah, I meant to put that on here. It's not on here. <laughs> Questions on this? So this is kind of showing how murky things can get. We start thinking about different languages and different types of semantics. Okay, so now I want to take some time since we're at this really cool low level uh, talking about code and how it's implemented. Um, so this is something that I really want to do because of my security background because we've been like touching this issue almost and so I just want to cover this so you can say yes I learned about this and I know exactly how this thing works. Um, so some of the implications of, so what's, what's CDECL? Yeah, the x86 Linux calling convention. So it's a calling convention for x86 processors of how to call functions. Uh, so what's stored on the stack when we call a function? The base pointer. Return what? Return address, which is what? Yeah, the next instruction to be executed when that function returns. So those are uh, both saved on the stack, right? So you're a program, you're running in x86, you're running on Linux. What memory can you read and write to at a high level? Any allocated memory, yeah. So pretty much anything, you can at least try. Right? You can try to write or read from any memory. You can definitely read or write to any allocated memory. So what prevents a function or a program from changing those values onto this, on the stack? Nothing. nothing, right? Nothing. There's nothing, there's no protection. It's just, what is it to the compiler, to the processor, it's all just memory, right? So what would happen if a function did and changed one of those values. Uh, what was that? You would have a sweet scoring, did you? Uh, you would have huh? a sweet? Weird way to think about it. Um, yeah, so if we could, so can we write to the stack, yes. the program? How do you know that? Yeah, because that's what the program's doing, right? It's pushing values onto the stack. It's writing to that memory. So clearly our program has permissions to read and write to that stack. Uh, so what would happen? What if I put, like, let's say all zeros where the instruction pointer is? Uh, it'll probably just terminate. It'll probably just terminate. Why? What, what is that zero memory? Yeah, what is it zero memory? So yeah, when it gets to the return instruction, right, where it pops a value off the stack sets the instruction pointer to that. Does the processor know that you didn't actually come from zero? No, it just knows, hey, I'm supposed to take that value off the stack and start executing at it, yeah. Doesn't the Linux OS prevent, if it's in kernel space, prevent you from going there? So, um, so when I say that you can read and write everywhere, I'm talking about your programs, so basically the the OS tricks your program to think that it has all access to the entire memory. So you can try reading and writing everywhere. Um, whether that's been allocated or deallocated, that makes a difference. So you're, that's how virtual memory in the operating system means that your program thinks it has the entire address space. Um, so, you don't, so there's actually no way that a program can access the operating system memory because it, it doesn't, it, it literally can't even ask for that address because it only sees everything that's all in its process space. Okay, let's look through an example. So this is kind of, we're, we're exploring this question of what would happen if these values change during program execution. Okay, so we have a function very similar to what we looked at before. Since we've kind of already done this, I will we'll kind of briefly go over this, so I'll go through it a little bit faster than I have before, uh, but please definitely ask questions. So here we have a function my copy that takes in a string pointer. It uh, has a local buffer called foo, 
and how many, how much space is there for food? Four bytes. Four bytes? How do you know four? Yeah, because there's a four here, right? This is how we specify. So we're basically saying that I want uh, where is and where is food stored? Stack on the stack. Why? Because it's not a pointer. It's a local variable. It's what? It's a local variable. Yeah, it's a local variable, right? It's not global, so it definitely has to be stored on the stack. Okay, now we're going to string copy string into foo. So what are the semantics of this string copy function? Take what is that, whatever is in string and put it in foo until you see the terminator. Right, so copy, so it's a string copy destination source. So take string, take a byte, the first byte of string, copy it to the first byte of wherever foo points, increment both of them, and keep doing that until string points to its null byte, a zero. And you keep doing that and keep copying. All right, and then just return. So our main function, uh, we're going to call callee and we're going to pass it an awesome string about CSE 340 being the best class you've ever taken and that it rocks. Just uh, and then we're going to print f after. So we're going to just print something else. And then we're going to return zero. So is this a valid C program? What was it? Always method for activity. Oh, huh, that's right. I changed the, the name of my copy because I wanted it to be not the same as the last one. Uh, so yeah, change this to my copy, and then do we have a valid function? Yes. Yeah. Yay, okay, good. Awesome. Good eye. I'll make a little note. All right. This is why programming on a PowerPoint is a lot easier. Okay, so this code compiles uh, to x86 code, which we've seen. So we first have the main function, which uh, does push EBP, move the stack pointer into EBP, subtract 16 bytes from the stack pointer. So uh, what are what what is this called of the function? Prolog, right? The prolog, everything that happens in the function beforehand. Uh, then we're moving some value onto the stack pointer and calling my copy. So what is this value? It's the instruction pointer, it's the address. So it's on the stack as the first thing that we pass to my copy. So what are the semantics of passing values onto the stack? Right, so we push from right to left the values onto the stack. So that, but there's only one parameter here, right? So if this is the value on the stack and this is the parameter, then what is it, what must this value be? Yeah, a pointer to this string, right? So the compiler said, oh, there's a constant string here. Let's just put this at some memory location. It happens to be, it just decides there. And then it says, OK, now I'm going to push this address onto the stack because we're passing in a car star. And what's inside of a car star? What's the value? If we were to draw the box circle diagram for a car star, what would the value of it be? An address. An address, right? An address of some a string. Yeah. OK. Uh, then we're going to move another value into EAX, move EAX onto the stack pointer, and call printf. So then what must be in this value? Huh? Another string. Another string. What is that string? After. Yeah, after, right? The string after. Perfect. So we don't know what these values are, right? But the compiler knows. It created global memory for these. And so it can pass these functions here. OK, then we move 0 into EAX, call leave, and call return. What's the 0 in EAX? The return value of what? Of main? 
Yep. Okay. Let's look at the my copy function. Uh, so we push EVP, move the stack pointer to ESV. We subtract 28 from the stack pointer. We move EVP plus 8 into EAX. What's ESV EVP plus 8? So 8 is up or down on the stack? Up. Or up. So let's see what it's doing with EAX. So then it moves EAX into ESP plus 4. Uh, it takes EBP minus C and puts it into EAX. Then it moves EAX onto the stack. And then it calls string copy. So maybe let's step through this to kind of see what happens. And then it calls leave and calls return. OK, so let's, yeah. So Wait, which one? Say it. Say it louder. Yes. So it takes EVP and adds 8 to it, and then moves, take whatever's in there and move it into EAX. And then take whatever's in EAX, which is what we just moved, and move it into ESP plus 4, so the stack pointer plus 4. And then take what's in, take EBP minus C from it, and take that value, put it in EAX, and then move EAX onto the stack pointer, and then call string copy. So let's 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 step through this. Okay, so here we have our registers. This time we only have to care about four registers. Uh, we have a bunch of assembly on the right, and we have a stack that's going to get surprisingly large. Um, okay, we'll just keep it at a previous value that we already had the stack at. So the stack pointer we know is FD2D4, uh, because I say it is. Um, and the base pointer is something, but what do we know that the base pointer has to be? Yeah. Yeah, the location of the frame pointer of the previous frame. So what do we know about it in relation to the stack pointer? got to be above it, right? So that was the problem we had last time. So I believe this is above it, right? <laughs> e, it's higher? Good, OK. I definitely made that. All right, and so we say that the instruction pointer is pointing at the first instruction of main. OK, so now we're going to kind of step through this. Uh, if you have questions, feel free. Raise your hands. You guys know the drill. OK, so we're going to push EDP onto the stack because we want to save whoever called us, our caller's EDP. Right? Because we need to use EVP as our frame pointer for function make. So we're going to push EVP onto the stack. We're then going to go to the next uh, instruction. We're going to move the stack, the current stack pointer into EVP, setting our base pointer as where the stack pointer is now. Then we're going to subtract 16 bytes from the current stack pointer. So that's 10 hex. So that's going to move the stack pointer down. Then we're going to move this constant value, whatever, some crazy constant value, onto the stack pointer, which is right here. And then we're going to call my copy. So when we call my copy, what happens? It stores the next address. It stores the next address. What's the next address? 423. Yeah, so it's going to push the next address to be executed onto the stack. So here we push 8048423 onto the stack, and the current stack pointer is pointing at FD2, FD2BC. Okay, everything's pretty normal, right? Yeah? Okay, now we're going to push EVP onto the stack to save main's base pointer. Right? We're going to move the stack pointer into EVP. So now we're setting our base pointer right now where the stack pointer is. And then we have to subtract 28 from, or 28 hex from ESP, which is, I believe, 40 in, um, uh, I believe it's 40 in decimal. So that's 10 things I had to make room for. So everything got a little bit smaller. Uh, if you have questions, speak up.
Okay, so we move the stack pointer all the way down, but the base pointer is still pointing at the top where the stack pointer was, right? So we just allocated some local space for our function by moving the stack pointer down. So now what's EBP plus eight? So we talk about this. What's EBP plus eight? What was it? Yeah, the location to that, that string that we pass in to call E, right? So we're going to take that, we're going to put it in EAX, and then we're going to take what's in EAX and move it onto the stack plus four. Okay. Next, we're going to take the base pointer, EBP minus C. So what's EBP minus C? So what do we know about um, references from the base pointer? So we know uh, if they're greater, if they're added, then what does that mean? They're above. There's, they're above. That's definitely what it means. What does it mean semantically? What is that to the function? What was that? Parameters. Parameters. Yeah, they're parameters to the function. Right? What about negative from the base pointer? Local variables. So what's the address EVP minus C? Which local variable? How many local variables does my copy have? One. One. So foo, right? So that's the location of foo is at EVP minus C. So we're going to take EVP, we subtract 12 from it, or C, we're going to move that into EAX. And then we're going to move EAX onto the stack pointer, right? And then we're about to call the function string copy. So now what are the values that we're, what are the parameters that we're passing to string copy? foo and string str, which is the parameter to call e, or to my copy. So here, so right, and this makes sense, right? So where is foo? What's the address of foo? It's right here, it's fd2ac, right? We calculated it, it's at edp minus c. And we know the address of the, uh, the parameter string because that was passed in to us. Right, so we know that that comes from up here, which is what's got, which is what got passed in to us. So now, what's what string copy going to do? Yeah. Can I take those two parameters and use? Yeah, so it's going to say, hey, whatever's at 804.8504, If that's not a zero copy whatever that byte is to wherever FD2AC, increment both numbers by one, so we move up one more byte, and then keep doing that. So copy, 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 copy. So when we increment FD2AC, which direction is that going to go? Up. It's going to go up, right? So when we copy that string, we copy, increment, copy, increment, copy, increment. We're going to act, copy up the string. How many bytes is there between us and how many bytes did we say that foo could hold? Four. Four. So the compiler looks like generously gave us a little extra space and a little extra breathing room on the stack. Uh, how much space is there between us and, let's say, something important? <coughs> 16? Yeah, 1, 2, well, I guess it depends on how we count. Yeah, four, four, boxes, four. three boxes. Yeah, I think it's three boxes, so 12 bytes in between us. And what's, what's this, FD2D0? What is it? It's the stack. It's the stack. What is it semantically? Where did it come from? It's what? Uh, it's not the return. Almost. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's mains frame pointer, exactly. So the first thing that we did was we pushed EDP onto the stack right here. And that's where this value came from. So then what's above that? The next address, the next instruction. The next address, the address of the next instruction that we're going to start executing from when we return. Awesome. OK, so we call string copy. So now what does our stack look like? Does it look like this? Nope. All right, well, we need to know where our string is, right? So this is our string, right? There's a zero at the end, but these are just the sequence of bytes. So these values, whatever their hex values are, these are represented in the string. String copy takes that, so it takes at FD2AC, so it copies ASU space, right, those four bytes into FD2AC, so it looks like ASU space. And it's a little weirdness. What's 20 in ASCII? Let me know if it's not their head. Space. Space. So why is it 20, 75, 73, 61? What's 61? A. A. Little endian. Little endian, yeah. So architecture, endianness of integers, right? Which is the least significant which is the least significant byte and the most significant byte? Uh, so here, uh, x86 is little endian, so even though we write the bytes out from FD2AC, FD2AC plus one, which is FD2AE, and then FD2B0, um, yeah, all the way up. When you look at that and you look at it as an integer, this is what it looks like, the integer of whatever hex 20, uh, 75, 73, 61. But does the copy function stop after copying these four characters? No. No. When does it stop? The end. What end? String terminates. Was it? String terminates. The string terminates. And which string? The value that is passed. The value that is passed is the second parameter. So in this case, uh, 804, 8504, right? This string. So it's going to keep copying until the end here. So the next four bytes are going to be CSE space. And is it done? No. No, it's going to do 340 space. Is it done yet? No. Oh, it's going to do fall. And then it's going to do space, two, space 201. And then it's going to do 5 space RO. And then it's going to do CKS exclamation point. And then it's going to write out a zero right after this, but I didn't want to. It didn't line up perfectly, so I didn't want to include it. So what happened to our stack? Clobbered. So is my program going to stop? No. No, right? It's, it's returned. String copy said, hey, I did what you wanted me to do. I took one string. I copied it into the location you gave me. And now I just return to you. Great. All right, leave. When I call leave, what happens? It's the reverse of this. So it's going to set the stack pointer to the current base pointer and pop EDP. So what's the value that's going to be in EDP? This one here? So if you do pop EDP here, I'm just going to take whatever that value is, copy it, put it in EDP, right? Because that's, that's all that these functions know how to do. They just take a value off the stack and put it in there. OK, now when I return, what are the semantics of return? Take that value that's currently on the stack, put it in the instruction pointer, and start executing there, right? So can I start executing at 3130-3220? Probably not, because there's probably no code there, right? So what am I going to get? <coughs> Segmentation fault. Segmentation fault, right? Because I tried to access memory that has not been allocated to my program. So that's going to give me a segmentation fault. Um, so, and you can run this. You can test this in GCC. 
Uh, you can run, you can run it. It'll give you a seg fault. If you put it in GDB to debug it, you can run it, and it'll say, "Hey, I'm starting this program. Everything's awesome." And then it goes, "Oh no, I got a seg fault here because I tried to execute this memory. I tried to, I tried to access this memory location that doesn't exist to try to execute stuff." And if you look at the registers here, you can see that. Um, the EVP, we changed the value of EVP because we erased the save base pointer. And we changed the stack pointer, the instruction pointer, to be what, whatever we wanted. OK, so, so why is this a problem? Why is this a security problem? Did you access memory that you weren't supposed to be able to access? Did you can access, so yeah, I can get your program to crash. Do I really care about crashing your program? No. Maybe, it depends on what it is, right? If it's going to give me a million dollars if I crash it, then I want to crash it. Right? Yeah? If you give it a special instruction string that would contain buttons for instructions. Yeah, so what if I, so I can control the instruction pointer. That means I can control where your program goes to start executing. So if I can get it to start executing something I want, then it'll start interpreting my data that I gave your program as code and start executing my code in your process, which means I'm running as your process and I can do anything your process can do. Uh, so this is one of the most common vulnerabilities in C and C++. Uh, so I really want to show this to you guys since we already talked about the base pointer and the EIP and because it's uh, really cool and very important. So anyways, thanks for listening. See you guys on Wednesday.